A few months after the Confederate Army lost the Civil War, the 13th Amendment was signed, abolishing slavery in the United States. But in the nearly 100 years between the signing of the 13th Amendment and the signing of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, something happened that would go on to shape the nation. At the beginning of the 20th century, 90% of the African American population lives in the South under conditions that can really only be described as oppressive. There's enormous levels of violence. Lynchings were a fairly common occurrence. Um, race riots were fairly common occurrence. I think so common that we ought to consider them a kind of normal way of being in the Jim Crow South. Author Brett Gadsden teaches history at Northwestern University. When historians talk about Jim Crow, we talk about a kind of overarching system of white supremacy and black subordination. Whites on top, African Americans in various subordinate positions in the political and economic and cultural life of the South. There is legalized segregation and there is always the extra legal threat of violence for any African American that crosses the unwritten cultural rules that are in place. African Americans are in many places restricted from walking on the sidewalk in, uh, with, with white people, um, certainly from riding on public transportation trains and buses um, with, with white people in, a, in an equal way. And African Americans are looking for ways to fight back, are looking for ways to participate in the democratic process to overturn this system as American citizens. They were traveling from one part of the country to the other. As Eitan Michaeli, author of The Defender, How the Legendary Black Newspaper Changed America, points out, what would come to be known as the Great Migration started with great journalism. Publishing was a fraught enterprise for African Americans in the South, but people did it um, uh, very courageously and oftentimes risked their lives to publish information that they felt their readers needed to have. There were a lot of publishers that had to uh, flee after they published something, and there were people that weren't able to flee and were, and were caught and were killed. The Defender was unique for decades, really, in exposing the horrors of, of Jim Crow segregation in the South. Launched in 1905 by Robert S. Abbott, the Chicago Defender started first as a weekly newspaper. Pullman Porters distributed it. That gave the paper the same reach as the railways, making its way deep into the segregated South. Once the Defender was inserted into the mail uh, stream, it was not removed. This is a very strange feature of Southern segregationists that uh, for whatever reason, with all the atrocities they were willing to commit, they were not really willing to interfere with the U.S. mail. Perhaps because there were federal penalties for that from a very early um, time in our history, but uh, the Defender was mailed freely throughout the South, even as Southern authorities spoke out against the newspaper. The Chicago Defender becomes really important as a kind of source of information about the economic opportunities for African Americans in the South, especially in the kind of shadow of World War I, where European migration gets effectively shut off. And so there's this kind of whole, there are all these new opportunities for African Americans in the industrializing North. And it becomes this great advertisement, right, for, and, and guide for the ways in which African Americans, the various ways that they could make their way north and to the opportunities that would await them. Readers of the Chicago Defender often wrote to the paper to share stories and seek information, a mix of dreams and desperation. Dear sir, I am a reader of the Chicago Defender. I think it is one of the most wonderful papers of our race ever printed. I'm writing to see if you all will please give me a job. Dear sirs, I'm enclosing a clipping of a lynching again, which speaks for itself. I do wish there could be sufficient pressure brought about to have federal investigation of such work. Dear sir, although I am a stranger to you, I am a man of the so-called colored race and can give you the very best reference to my character and ability from prominent citizens of my community, both white and colored people that know me. I won't nothing more than to come to Chicago to live. Dear sir, I am so sick, 
I am so tired of such conditions that I sometimes think that life for me is not worthwhile. Well, African Americans were literally running for their lives. What makes the Great Migration so important in the kind of larger history of African Americans and in the United States general is the sheer enormity of the numbers. During the first wave of the Great Migration, between 1910 and 1940, it's reported that nearly two million blacks left the South. African Americans, when they grabbed, when they migrated to these northern cities, they faced many new challenges and some challenges that look a lot like the ones that they forced to flee. The problem of police violence seemed to you know, follow African Americans wherever they went. Housing segregation, school segregation. But I don't think they were any, under any illusions that this was like in a literal sense, that these places in a literal sense were a promised land. African Americans, yes, are coming to the North because there are jobs in the North, there are opportunities um, in the North that are not available in the South, but to be frank, they're coming at a time that um, there are jobs in the South as well. There are steel mills in Birmingham, just like there are in Gary, Indiana. What's different is that in the North, there's the opportunity to vote and to organize and to participate in the political process in a way that is not available in the South. I think it's important to understand the extent to which we have the emergence of these new, concentrated, and in quantitative terms, pretty robust black voting blocs. We begin to see white elected officials begin to attend to the questions and concerns about their black constituents who can vote. If black voters didn't have the option to elect black representatives, they certainly were positioned strategically to um, weigh in and determine the fate of one or another white candidate. There's a huge impact in terms of the politics of the country, for sure. The African Americans who move from the South to the North come as Republicans. They come as members of the party of Lincoln, the party that was founded to end slavery, the party that sponsored Reconstruction under President Grant for uh, nearly a decade. But when they came to the North, they were open to new modes of political participation, and this was just at the time that the Democratic Party was changing. The Democratic Party had been the party of Southern segregationists, uh, seen as a politically corrupt uh, operation. It was Franklin D. Roosevelt's second candidacy that brought African Americans to the Democratic Party. Until that moment, Republicans had been the dominant party in the United States. The Great Migration made um, the Democratic Party the dominant party in the United States. It was really African American voters and the way that they moved, and in particular, the states that they flipped. Illinois, Ohio, New York, Pennsylvania. So much about African Americans and the ways in which they've resisted their conditions, the ways in which they've resisted racial subordination and white supremacy is about perfecting the union. It reveals to us the ways in which African American history is a national history. We look to media often what we're doing. National Association of Black Journalists President Ken Lemon says the black press is proud to continue pushing for justice for all. There's almost always much more work to do. Uh, we, we every now and then, and I, and I talk about this with people who have the opportunity to be in the media, say, you know, I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. And then there's always that caveat, but if our ancestors knew what we were capable of today, would they stop here? Are we doing enough to say that we stretch the bounds the way the defender did? Are we doing enough to make sure that coverage duplicates what the defender was doing at its, at its station in time? And so the challenge never goes away. We have not fully realized what those people who moved from the South to the North really wanted to happen in this country. I would say it's an open question whether we've made the progress that is sufficient, but you can certainly see the results and the accomplishments that they achieved in their families, in the way that our 
Cities in the North have been transformed in the cultural output of the United States, which is not just the product of African Americans on their own, but is also the product of African Americans working with other people. That's on every level, political, social, economic, uh, religious. There's no realm in, in American life that hasn't been touched by the Great Migration and its, its uh, benefits. We do well to remember that the diversity that many of us prize today in many communities is in large part a function of that, the choices, the very deliberate and courageous choices that fundamentally transforming the United States of America.